I, uh, I appreciate you coming out on such a dismal day. It seems wrong somehow that Easter came before spring. You know, we're still, we're still in winter. In addition to uh, uh, thanking Kevin for uh, inviting me and for uh, uh, Tony for still for mentioning me, I appreciate you uh, having me. Uh, also, my wife Betty attended over my strenuous objections, but I'm glad she's here. And a friend of mine, Professor Lechness, is in the back recording this for posterity, so thank you, Skip. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the next thing will be what I see as kind of the anti-competition or the self-esteem movement. Uh, the third thing will be Buddhism and maybe if we can learn something from Buddhism. And then finally, an idea or two about where we ought to go and how we ought to look at competition. I was kind of surprised when I started looking at this I don't consider myself a competitive person. I think of myself more as kind of a bookworm. But <clears throat> as I began to look at the issue of competition, I found out there's a lot of good things I like about it. Um, to be successful in competition, I realize I'm hanging down here, but that's all right. Uh, it requires greater effort. You can't just participate. You've got to focus and actually put out some attention. It requires certain skills. Certain skills are kind of across the board. Things like uh, hand-eye coordination, visual acuity, those kind of things can apply in a lot of different competition uh, arenas. I'll talk a lot about sports because I'm a guy and guys watch sport and eat junk food and that's kind of what we do. So a lot of my analogies will be in sports. Of course, there are competition specific skills, uh, leaping and running in basketball, strength and aggressiveness in football, public speaking and politics. So. In addition to the general skills that you might get through competing that you might enhance and develop, there are specifics. Uh, also, anytime you compete, you're going to learn something new. You're going to learn that information and you're going to begin to assimilate it into your action, your personality, and apply that information to new arenas of interaction. Also, you're going to practice. If you compete and you're going to be successful in competition, you're going to compete. If you haven't read a book by Malcolm Gladwell, I encourage you to do so. He's got several books out. Uh, the one that I'm thinking of right now has to do with outliers. And what he looks at, what we typically call genius. And what he discovered was genius equals about 10,000 hours of practice. If you practice enough, somehow you become a genius. It reminds me of a quotation attributed to Thomas Edison that said, uh, Genius is 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration. When you look at the incandescent light bulb, he had hundreds of failures before he finally came up with a figment, uh, filament that would actually work. There are some other books by Gladwell that you might think about. Tipping Point, Blink, anything by this, this guy is excellent. You'd enjoy it. Uh, you're also going to learn, if you compete successfully, social integration. Even if it's a solitary sport, like throwing a javelin or something like that, you're still going to have to get along with other people. You're going to have officials. You're going to have fellow competitors. You're going to have referees. You're going to have coaches. You've got to have the social skills to get along. If it's a team sport, it's even more obvious that you're going to have to learn to get along with other people. And when they look at leaders in society or business or other areas, a lot of times they're people who've had an active life in steam in team and competitive sports. There are benefits uh, uh, beyond this in competition behind the skills and the things that you develop. You can develop pride for the success you have in competition, recognition from others, rewards, things like that. One of the things that I think is often overlooked as a benefit of competition is learning to accept defeat. I can't imagine there's ever been an athlete or anybody that's competed in a serious way in any arena who hasn't been defeated, who hasn't lost. Learning to deal with that, learning to accept that, learning to move forward, I think is a very healthy skill. And also learning to deal with bad luck, bad breaks, bad calls by the referee, things that aren't, quote, fair. I remember, and I'm not a big basketball fan, but I remember watching a clip of Michael Jordan 
back in the 80s. He's playing in an important game, and he gets a very bad call. And he turns around and runs down the other end of the field, and he just smiles. Those are the breaks. So learning to deal with that, I think, is an extremely important life skill. Learning to profit from, move beyond such experiences is a great life skill. We don't think, I, that that's great. Uh, another benefit of competition is the societal good. We often think in economics. The free enterprise system is based on the idea that we compete to offer the best product at the best price. Good products drive out bad products. Um, I'm old enough to remember when buying something made in Japan meant, was, meant it was not good, okay? It was a piece of crap. Now, when you buy something made in Japan, more often than not, it's a very good product. China's in the kind of the same situation. You buy a, a, a Chinese product, eh, not so good. But it's cheap, it's available. So good products in economic competition tend to drive out bad products. And as the Japanese compete, uh, their products got better. I was talking to a guy not long ago about a motorcycle, and he said, it's American made. And I thought, I don't care, you know? What I want is a good bike, not necessarily a bike that's made in America. I want the best I can get. And if the Japanese build a better one, I'm okay with it. Now, of course, my father is spinning in his grave at this point because he was in the Pacific in World War II, and he wouldn't anymore buy a Japanese product than he'd fly, but I'm not my father. Uh, talk a little bit about rules and the role of rules, and it's very obvious what those roles are, maybe except for the last one. Rules determine the type of activities which are allowed and disallowed, punishments for transgressions, the length of competition, the participants, the methods of determining victory, enforcement mechanisms and the enforcer. And I think most important, it provides an overall structure for the competition. And my thought is you need to embrace that structure and not try to work around it. I'm reminded of haiku. Uh, all of you, most of you know, haiku is a very short poem. Five syllables in the first line, seven syllables in the second line, five syllables in the third line. And the trick is to convey something meaningful in a very structured format. And I think if you can compete successfully and embrace the rules in a very structured way, that's great. You learn something. Those are the positives of competition. Of course, there are pitfalls. Uh, one pitfall is a lot of people don't compete for various reasons, and we don't get the benefit of their competition, and they don't get the benefit of that competition. Uh, some of them are prohibited from competing. Remember, the NBA, the NFL, Major League Baseball, there was a color barrier. There's a new movie out, Jackie Robinson, 42, talking about, you know, it's hard for us to imagine that there were times when this was the case. I was teaching a class once and I told them, I remember living in Georgia when you had whites only fountains and colored fountains. My class said, oh no, that's not true. I said, yes, I remember that. I'm old enough to remember that. Some people don't have the resources to compete. Therefore, they don't benefit and we don't benefit. Even Little League, if you've got a Little Leaguer, you know that's several hundred dollars you're gonna have to put out over the course of the season, uniforms, pizza, candy, goodies, whatever. Money required for political campaigns. Our last campaign, the last I heard, cost about a billion dollars. That's B with a billion, okay? Think about the fact most politicians at the national level spend most of their time begging for money. Now, what does that do to the political process? You have to have resources. Some people are disinclined or unwilling to compete. Maybe they're shy. I always think of the counterculture of the 60s, you know, we're not gonna compete, we're not gonna get caught in that rat race. 
So everybody doesn't compete, everybody doesn't benefit, the society doesn't get the benefits of everybody's willingness to compete. And I call hyper-competition, wretched excess. That's when the goal of the competition becomes more important than what I call healthy competition or participation in the competition. And I have to go back to examples in education because I spent a lot of time there. Uh, in education, sometimes more often than we probably want to admit, students want the good grades. They don't necessarily want the education those grades represent. Okay. In Buddhism, we call this mistaking the map for the territory. Mistaking the symbol, the grade, for the thing, the learning itself. Hypercompetition leads to cheating, breaking the rules. Fortunately, a few weeks ago, I got to go to Greece and visit the original site of the Olympics. And along one side, leading to the stadium, there used to be a series of statues of Zeus. And these were built with the money they collected from cheaters. And at the bottom of the statue on the base, they would list the name of the cheater that got caught, his father's name, and the city he was from. It leads to bribing officials. There was a recent scandal and one of the uh, officials tried to bribe the governing body of the International Football Association, soccer, so he could become the head. I'll just mention some things. It leads to attacking competitors, Tonya Harding. It leads to doping, Lance Armstrong. It leads to throwing the game. I think it was the 1919 Black Sox through the World Series. Betting on the outcome, shaving points, Pete Rose. This is one of my favorites, a Texas cheerleader mom. Now, I don't remember whether they actually killed the other mother or they just plotted, okay? But there was the mother of a girl who didn't make the cut on a cheerleading squad. So she was plotting to have the mother of a cheerleader who did make it kill so that her daughter could get that slot. There's a movie about it. <laughs> One of those A&E &E, &E movies. And, and last, I guess, cheating, dissembling, redefining, and just plain lying. Banks, the Great Recession of 2008. They took a lot of subpar loans, mixed them with uh, home loans, mixed them with some other loans, sliced and diced, and sold them as good bonds or derivatives, which I don't even think we know what a derivative really is, but that's what they did. And on the one hand, they're dumping this stuff when their investment's in it. They're dumping it because they realize it's junk. And on the other hand, they're telling their clients, oh, yeah, these are good bonds. You need to buy these things. A number one, cheating. So it leads, hyper-competition leads to cheating. It also infects and distorts the priorities of the institutions that are involved. I see little league parents screaming. I, I was leaving the ballpark one day and I saw a parent screaming at some coach about uh, her son not being allowed, or his son not being allowed to play as much as he should or something like that. And I paid for this and blah, blah, blah. And you pay like $35 at that time for your kid to play. And I thought, you know, if you paid that coach minimum wage, for the hours he put in, you couldn't afford to have your kid play Little League, and yet you're yelling at him for, because he's not letting your kid play enough. Another Little League experience, this one in football. I think my son was about 10 or 12, and we were playing another team that was supposed to be a lot better than we were, but unfortunately for them, we were winning. And there were like two minutes left in the game, and we're like eight, eight yard line, and we're about ready to score, and this was a, you know, hyper-competitive team that they were, they were great and they couldn't believe our mediocre team was winning. And so as we got ready, or they got ready to uh, snap the ball and did, they, the other team had called the timeout just before this. Our kids snapped the ball and the other team immediately, all 11 of them just lay down flat on the ground. And our kids look around like, what's going on? you know, being good coaches, 
run, go score a touchdown, go score a touchdown. The other team just simply, just simply lay flown on the ground and let our team score. And it was like, well, you're not good enough to beat us. We're just going to show you we don't care one way or another. And I thought, what kind of lesson does that teach a child that if we can't get our way, we'll just not play? It just seemed bizarre to me. And this, again, this is one of my favorites, U.S. government. Infecting the institutional culture is what I'm talking about. What is, what is enhanced interrogation? What's torture. torture? Right. Okay. What is rendition? That's when you subcontract torture, okay? When we capture somebody, and by the way, torture usually almost always never gives you good information. You start torturing me, I'm going to tell you anything you want to hear. I'll, I'll do skip in, I'll do my wife, I don't care, you know, pain is not my friend, okay? Rendition is when the U.S. government captures somebody and they say, well, we're not really going to torture this person, but we'll turn them over to the Israelis or we'll turn them over to the Pakistanis because we know they don't mind torturing, okay? I'm not saying we should be nice to terrorists, I'm saying there are limits and hyper-competition infects the institution that's involved. And this is very unfortunate and it's probably not good for me to say this, but the case of the student up at OSU who was accused of molesting other boys in the dorm and the official didn't turn it over to the police. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. This kid would go up and molest some other male sleeping in the apartment or the dorm room or whatever, and the officials at OSU did not turn that over to the police because they said they couldn't because of FERPA, the Family Educational Whatever, Whatever Privacy Act. Very questionable in my mind. And of course, the most famous one is Penn State and Sandusky. I mean, they knew, and I'm blaming people that are like me, bureaucrats in the higher education system, who are more concerned about the image of their institution than they were about doing the right and legal thing. That's scary. Cheating also leads to disrespect for other rules such as social mores, norms, laws. A couple of quotes, I don't know who, who said this one. If you're not cheating, you're not trying. Uh, this one, I think, I know who said it. Only poor people pay taxes. Leona Helmsley. Remember Leona Helmsley? Okay. Now, one of my favorite. Self-esteem. I consider this the anti-competitive movement. There's competition, its pluses and minuses, and then there's, oh, let's don't compete. Let's make nice. Self-esteem, definition, judgment of one's worthiness, feeling of self-worth. Early social scientist, Maslow, included self-esteem as the fourth level in his hierarchy of needs. Said that you had to have self-esteem before you could self-actualize. Uh, Carl Robert, Rogers, excuse me. Problems originate when people consider themselves unworthy of love. Now, I want you to listen to this next sentence. I'm going to read it carefully. I took a little bit out, but it's fairly accurate. Every human, with no exception, is worthy of unconditional respect of everybody else. Jeffrey Dahmer is worthy of respect. You know who Jeffrey Dahmer is? The cannibal. Okay. He deserves to, be, to esteem himself and to be esteemed. I'll read the first part again. Every human with no exception is worthy of unconditional respect of everybody else. Hitler. Hitler loved his dog. Well, that kind of thinking and the counterculture of the 60s and through the 90s led to what we call the self-esteem movement. And you need to generate, if, if low self-esteem is the problem, my wife 
is sick of Jody Arias, okay? For those of you who don't, aren't home in the daytime, Jody Arias is on TV. She murdered her boyfriend. She had low self-esteem, okay? So if she has low self-esteem, how, how do you overcome that? Unconditional praise. Reward for participation rather than achievement. Not keeping score. Everybody is a winner. Everybody is special. Now think about that. If everybody's special, nobody's special, right? Now, self-esteem, two critical periods in self-esteem development. Childhood, and I'm not saying all self-esteem is bad. I'm just saying we've gone too far. That, and in a way to me, self-esteem is kind of an oxymoron. Esteem is something I think you get from other people. I'm not sure you get it from yourself. But anyway, in childhood, caring, supportive parents, and unconditional love translate into self-esteem. In education, adolescence is a critical period for developing self-esteem. And in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, activities were designed to enhance mastery and a sense of accomplishment. Focus on positive behaviors. Ignore negative behaviors, which is okay until they start shooting meth or something. Now, it took a while, but in the late 80s and 90s, they began to say, well, let's see if this self-esteem stuff really works. We're social scientists. Let's go out and do some social science stuff. Um, first thing, is, is low self-esteem really a reason for non-achievement? And I quote this guy a couple of times. I don't know him, but I just ran across him. Roy Baumeister. Criminals, drug abusers, and bullies often think, often think fairly highly of themselves. We also all know the stereotypical serial killer who's outwitting the dumb cops, Ted Bundy. Now this is my favorite. Listen to the, listen to the group that commissioned this study. In 1987, the California Task Force to Promote Self-Esteem and Personal and Social Responsibility commissioned the study and hired nine social scientists to study self-esteem and achievement. Unfortunately, it didn't work out. There was no evidence of cause and effect between low self-esteem and social problems. No relation, no cause and effect between low self-esteem and social problems such as crime, violence, drug abuse, welfare, etc. There was no evidence that high self-esteem enhanced social, uh, excuse me, academic achievement. The California Task Force to Promote Self-Esteem and Personal and Social Responsibility paid for that. I bet they weren't happy. Uh, Peer-reviewed research has not validated the assumption between self-esteem. Encouraging self-pride fails if the students don't actually achieve. Inflating self-esteem has no positive effect on grades. In fact, it might actually decrease grades. There was an article in the paper in the Oklahoma a couple of days ago about an English teacher who was complaining that students quit turning in their essays. And the reason they quit turning in their essays is if they pass, if they flunk the course, and they pass the end of instruction exam, that F was changed to a D. And so they're like, why bother? Also, Calvin and Hobbes. You remember Calvin and Hobbes? 1992, Calvin tells Hobbes, homework is bad for my self-esteem. It sends the message I don't know enough. So instead of trying to learn, I'm just, just concentrating on liking myself just the way I am. Okay. Uh, Albert Ellis, self-esteem movement is essentially self-defeating and ultimately destructive. Roy Baumeister and John Tierney, the self-esteem movement can be significantly counterproductive and parental efforts towards self-esteem may inhibit self-control. Why did it fail? It bases self-worth on imaginary or relative achievements. It encourages belief that you're always right. It ignores negative behaviors that can have real consequences. For example, jail. Creates problems when a person confronts failure or real achievements of others. Creates a sense of entitlement. Well, the effects of self-esteem. 
Many children of this generation, talking 82 forward maybe, believe that they can do no wrong. I've been in class when a teacher, when a student has said, well, that's just your opinion. And I want to say, yes, but it's a better informed and a better educated opinion than yours, okay? And it's based on some kind of social science. A generation that is self-obsessed, irresponsible, and motivated. A generation with a feeling of entitlement. No, not all. I'm not talking all. I'm talking many. A generation with a feeling of entitlement. Coming in the class, well, I've got to have an A in this class. Well, you'll get an A if you earn it. No, I've got to have an A. A generation with helicopter parents who swoop in and protect them from any and all real or perceived negative consequences. Everybody in education has dealt with that. I almost guarantee you. And a generation that need, see no need to work to improve themselves. The daily affirmation with Stuart Smalley on Saturday Night Live, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me. Okay? No reason to get better. Well, what in the heck does that have to do with Buddhism? Eh, it's probably a stretch, but we'll, we'll see. I'm going to make a distinction between what I call Buddhist philosophy and Buddhist religion. And in a way, Buddhism isn't a, isn't a religion. On his deathbed, he's 80 something. The story goes he ate some rotten fish and died because uh, he didn't want to offend the host by turning down the meal. Uh, but out on his deathbed, his students are all, they're all upset and they're crying and, oh, aren't you divine, aren't you divine? And he said, you still don't get it, do you? I'm just trying to teach you how to live in this world. I don't say anything about the world beyond. So I'm going to concentrate on the things that we're pretty sure that he believed in that he said and not get into the, the religious aspect of it too much. Uh, now, it's, a problematic, it's problematic in a sense because for three or 400 years they didn't write anything down about what he said, and all these things grew up about him. When you look at Buddhist religion, things I'm not really going to talk about, they have all the trappings of any other religion. They have Buddhism, bodhisattvas. By the way, anybody can be a Buddha if they become enlightened. A bodhisattva is someone who simply decides not to go to nirvana, to stay back in the real world, to help the rest of us get better. They have, the Buddhist religion has monks and nuns and monasteries. It has practices, meditation, koans, sutras, chanting, prayers, pilgrimages. It has various schools, Theravada, Mahayana, Tantra, Zen, Pure Land, etc. It has gods and demons. It has all the attributes that you think of in a traditional or maybe not so traditional religion. Talk a little bit about misconceptions about Buddhism, at least in my mind that's nihilistic, that's very negative. Actually, Buddha wanted to wake us up to what the world is really like, in my mind. Another misconception is that meditation is a waste of time. Again, I don't practice it. But there have been very serious studies that looked at meditation and found there are very real benefits from meditation. Real physiological benefits and psychological benefits meditation. Most of you know the story about Buddha's life. He was protected from bad things because his father was afraid. He was born a prince. His father was afraid he'd become some sort of wandering ascetic and, and turn to a religious life, and he didn't want him to do that. His father wanted him to stay a prince. He was born around 563 B.C. and lived for about 80 years. He marries his cousin, who's very beautiful. They have a son. But he escapes from the palace where he's been protected from bad things and he begins, he takes four trips outside the palace and begins to see things he hadn't seen before. Disease, poverty, old age, death, things that his father had protected him from. He even encounters a holy man. Again, all the things his father wanted to shield him from. So he makes a decision to abandon his life as a prince and he escapes he leaves his wife and child behind, not exactly a role model, I guess. And he escapes to the forest where he hunts down and studies under some of the most famous aesthetics, 
some of the most famous teachers of his age. And he begins to practice asceticism, a denial of the flesh, and he practices that to an extreme. Privation, mortification of flesh. He nearly dies of starvation. But he still doesn't feel like he has the answer. So one day, he sits down under the Bodai tree. Now again, this is where legend gets all mixed in, because Bodai means wisdom. He sits down under this tree and he says, I'm not going to get up until I have the answer. And he sits there, and suddenly it dawns on him the answer is the middle way. It's neither indulgence, hedonism, extreme hedonism, nor asceticism, denial. It's a middle way. And he comes up with four noble truths. And the pur purpose of four noble truths is to explain why there's evil in the world. Now, philosophers don't worry about why there's pleasure in the world. We just take it. We don't worry about why there's good in the world. Okay, we like good. We don't worry about why there's beautiful sunsets. Philosophers worry about why is there evil in the world? Why do people suffer? Why do innocents suffer? Why do bad things happen to good people? Philosophy that's known as the problem of evil. He comes up with the four noble truths which are his answer for why there is suffering in the world. And the four noble truths are suffering exists, suffering has a cause, the cause of suffering is desire, that cause can be eliminated, and that cause can be eliminated through what he calls the Eightfold Path or living the good life. And the Eightfold Path involves right understanding, right thought, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. And by the way, speaking of mindfulness, when I stepped down, the last day I was interim president at OSU OKC, uh, we had the vice president, gosh, I can't remember her name, from Chesapeake come speak as our graduation speaker. She's vice president of human resources, very high up, Martha Berger speak to us as the graduation speaker, and we just hired Natalie Shirley as the new president of OSU OKC. And as the last act, that was graduation. And Martha Berger spoke on mindfulness and how you need to be aware and be focused on where you are right now and be tuned in, in effect, to what's going on. I thought that was very interesting. If somebody deeply ensconced in the corporate world would talk about a Buddhist concept called mindfulness. Okay. Anyway, the last of the eight fold path, right concentration. Let's come back to competition a little bit and see if Buddhism has anything to say about that. I looked up the etymology of competition, and I think it's Latin. And it means to seek with. Well, that's interesting because it doesn't, you know, beat down your opponent. It means it's kind of like a joint effort. And to me, what you're seeking are long term benefits. The things we talked about that are positive about com competition the skills development, the self, self confidence, the contributions to society versus the short term rewards which are praise, prizes, fame, that kind of thing. The skills you learn from healthy competition will probably be with you the rest of your life. A short-term benefit? Eh, probably not. So, and this is a stretch, but I thought, okay, can I think of a way to apply the Eightfold Path to competition? And I'll go each of these, and again, maybe it's a stretch, but We'll see. Right understanding. Seeking the real benefits of competition, not that is the long-term gains, not the short-term gains. The skills you, you uh, develop, the social integration, that kind of thing. Right thought, respect for the rules, officials, and competitors. Watching one of these silly, oh, world's dumbest whatever. And, you know, baseball, little league coaches, one of them takes out the baseball bat and he's trying to kill somebody else while his wife's on his back trying to get him to calm down. 
respect for, he lost his respect for his, because the other coach wouldn't shake hands with him and say good game, or because he wouldn't, I forgot which. Respect for rules, officials, right thought, right speech, no trash talking, no libeling, slandering competitors, right action, effort channeled within the law or the rules, no doping, not hurt, right livelihood, not hurting, harmlessness, right effort. Too much effort may be as counterproductive as too little effort. Right mindfulness, attentiveness, being in the moment, concentrate, right concentration, intense focus. You know, athletes talk about being in the zone or not thinking. Um, when these samurai or martial arts people talk about if you think you're dead, if you think you're going to lose, it has to be what we call instinctual, instinctual, without overthinking. So maybe the Eightfold Path has some, has some benefits to uh, competition. The middle way, it's good to compete. There are benefits of competing, but it has to be in a, maybe righteous is the wrong word, but a healthy way. And accepting it's not always going to work out the way you want. You're not always going to win. But the benefits accrue from the competition itself, not necessarily the prize. And then the last slide, what does this have to do with self-esteem? Well, rather than trying to build Johnny up with undeserved praise and telling him he's special and you shouldn't compete, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe we should work on developing Johnny's self-confidence or Susie's self-confidence. The problem with self-esteem, it's not based on merit. It's a shortcut to achievement that really doesn't work. To me, self-esteem is an oxymoron. I get esteem from others, okay? I don't esteem myself, that seems a little strange to me. To me, esteem is respect or admiration. It's granted to you by others based on achievement, wisdom, or worth. It's not self-appointed. It's not self-anointed versus self-confidence. Self-confidence is something we develop over a lifetime when we begin to believe in our personal ability to achieve or persevere or get through something. I can deal with this. You know, one of the benefits of people being involved in, in athletics or, com or other forms of competition or social interaction in college or other places is you learn to deal with a variety of situations, you learn to deal with a variety of personalities, and after a while you develop the confidence that I can deal with this. Whatever's thrown at me, I can handle it. And this is our belief in our personal ability to achieve or persevere. And we earn this through experience and competition involving success, failure, acceptance of misfortune, and participation in a variety of circumstances or arenas. So again, it's the oldest cliche in the world, I guess, but it's not whether you win or lose, but it's how you play the game. Because then you can walk away saying, I did my best, or smiling like Michael Jordan did when he got a bad call, and instead of like that, he just said, isn't that silly, and went down the other end of the court. So thank you for your kind attention. And if you have any questions, I'll try to answer them, or I'll just bail, either way. Thank you, Kevin. Any questions? Yes. Absolutely, because you know, Mark Twain said, human beings are the only animal which can display shame and the only ones that should. And when we do bad things, like hurt ourselves, like not recognize 
what a precious thing <clears throat> life is, we need to say, this is not right. You don't need to feel good about this. You need to think about another way. Uh, so, yeah, I don't, I think that would just, I, I don't think that would help. In my, I'm not a psychologist, so, you know, what do I know? <laughs> I, I saw recently that I'm, poli sci was my area in the political science, and Congress recently cut out all funding or somehow funding for uh, research in political science. <laughs> so what do I know? But no, I don't, think, I don't think it solved anything because it's based on the false premise. And the research has shown that just telling somebody you're wonderful, we know what we do and what we don't do. We know in our heart of hearts what we're proud of and what we're ashamed of. And if you, if you try to do something that does not work, I don't think you're going to get good results. So no, I don't think, I don't think that will help. Saying, okay, you made a mistake, let's go forward and let's see how we can make the best of the situation. Again, another cliche. Another question? Yes. Being honest with them, there, you know, there, um, Buddhism talks about grandmotherly kindness, you know, and sometimes that meant whacking a student on the head. I'm not suggesting that, but I'm saying, you know, if you're in a monastery back a thousand years ago, the monk saw you dozing off, you may come up and whack you with a stick, wake up, you're meditating, not sleeping. But to say sincere feedback, I'm sorry, I don't see your best effort here. Or this is good, but, because they're honest. They know whether they put out the effort. They know whether they've met your standards or not. One of the mistakes I made as a teacher was not having high enough standards because I think students live up to the standards that you have. And uh, so I think showing, giving them honest feedback in a, kind, in a grandmotherly kindness way is the best way to let them know okay, not this time, but you can do better. Or I see this good, but this needs to be improved. Honest feedback. Otherwise, it's like the self-esteem. You're, you're giving them praise for something they didn't earn, and then suddenly that praise is, is uh, cheapened. Uh, but I know it's tough because, you know, I used to get complaints. Well, my teacher told me that my paper wasn't any good. Yeah, that's right. Well, that makes me think I'm stupid. Well, no, that's not really the point. So they're real touchy. You know, uh, I don't know about Betty, but I think I got out just in time. Okay. <laughs> I, I think I got out of the classroom just in time. Yes? Well, that's a good question. I'm trying to think of an answer. I, I think part of it is through, and I'm sure you're doing it, through your modeling. If you read in the house, if you have books in the house, your children are going to think, oh, well, this is something just we do. If you work hard and you pay your bills, your children go, oh, yeah, okay, this is what we do. Okay, whether anybody notices it, whether I get away, oh, I do the right thing, you know, somebody said morality is doing the right thing even when nobody's looking. So I think if you, you say, that's nice, but what did you learn today? Explain to me how, I don't want to hear about the hearts, I want to hear about what, you, what new things did you pick up today? And to demonstrate you're interested in learning, you're interested in doing the right thing. I think that's... Yeah, he said all the time, I want to go to college like you, and I'm like, but you have to learn the research. <laughs> Yeah. You know, I just, I'm not, I'm not nice and sweet. I'm kind of like reckless. 
But you see, I think the world is tough. Yeah. And I think this is part of the problem with the self-esteem movement is it's all roses. It ain't all roses. Everybody knows that. It is. And it's the people who understand that it takes effort, it isn't fair, you got to persevere, et cetera. You know, Skip has 30 years at Rose State. My wife had 35. That's perseverance. First year I worked at Old Triple C, or Sock Jock, as we called it, South Oklahoma City Junior College, first semester. And it was awful. It was screwy. It was crazy. It, had a, it was a screwball system that didn't work. One of the guys bailed, after, bailed out after one semester. After one semester, he, he, a faculty person left. Forty years later, it's the biggest single campus community college in the state of Oklahoma. You have to persevere. And giving up the first time that you get negative feedback, uh, you're not going to get very far. Yes? Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, scratch me, I'm a redneck. Just, that's, sorry. I think it's overblown. It's kind of, uh, uh, I'm not apologizing for bullies. I think it's overblown. We're all going to have to deal with bullies in our lives. Um, whether they're physical bullies, emotional bullies, other kinds of things. We're going to have to learn how we deal with that. And I think it's usually not worth getting in a physical confrontation about. Uh, one of my favorite stories about Socrates is um, after the Athens was defeated by the Athenian, I mean by the Spartans, they set up this Tyranny of 30, this group of oligarchs who were ruling Athens in the Spartans' name. And they called Socrates and some other people in and said, go down and arrest so-and-so. And they knew that if he did it, he'd be tainted with their crimes. And if he didn't do it, they'd accuse him of disobeying the law and execute him. Well, the other four guys went to arrest so-and-so. Socrates went home. He didn't, meh, I'm not going to do it. He didn't rant and rave. He just went home. Well, fortunately, he didn't get killed over it. What's the point? The point is get away from them. Vacate the area. Go someplace else. Don't, uh, people will bully you if you let them. I'm not really suggesting that you confront them. I'm not very confrontational. But just walk away go home. I, I think it's overblown, but I think kids and adults, and I never was very good at dealing with bullies, you've got to learn to deal with it one way or another. And maybe the best way is just to say, I'm not going to play this game. Somebody cuts you off in traffic, flips you off in traffic, you know, you want to get even, you want to pull up and do all The smartest thing to do is just turn left at the next intersection and get away from it or ignore it because you don't want to have a shootout on 63rd Street. I mean, really. Yes, sir. This question is a little more abstract. Okay. Um, how do you think a growing population drives a trend for a type of competition with perhaps a, a relatively big number of opportunities to compete and stand out? And so on, and more people competing to be seen in the space of getting into medical school or to I, I think it is inevitable in the sense there'll always be cheaters. There'll always be people who look at the short term good. And, and that's what bothers me a lot about crime is, is I worry too much. You know, if I commit a major crime, I'll spend the rest of my life worrying about that rather than enjoying the fruits of whatever the crime might be. So I think there'll always be some cheaters. But on the other hand, I think there are lots of ways to compete in a healthy way that really, you don't have to go to the hyper-competition. Uh, I was at Rotary yesterday, and, and, I, and you know, 
I saw a lot of kids, junior Rotarians, getting scholarships, and a lot of them were obviously from some other culture at one point or another. And some of them were going to the Naval Academy, one was going to the Naval Academy, and one was going to Yale, and all. And my point is simply, those kids probably came here with not much, okay? And they're achieving because they're willing to compete in a healthy way. I think there are always avenues for, for, for healthy competition, whatever it might be. Maybe I didn't understand your question. No, I'll, I'll agree with that. There's always going to be avenues for healthy competition. But towards hyper, just because there, there's a relatively limited number you know, or a constant number of opportunities, if, if for example, 25 years ago, Right. And, and again, the, 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 force that I, the force that I think is driving that is a, a growing population of Hispanic population, uh, driving that kind of population. I wonder if you see it that way. Or I, don't know that it's, I don't know that it's population as much as a kind of uh, decline in the traditional values that, you know, and this is, this is the problem with the economy, as if I know what I'm talking about that managers today are judged not by how well their company does over a 10-year period, but what you do for me last quarter. You know, the short-term gain over the long-term benefit. Uh, Enron, the smartest guys in the room, the name of the book. They would set a target to say, okay, this quarter we're gonna report that we earn X amount of money now, cook the books to figure out how we can make it look like we earned X amount of money. But actually, we didn't come close to that. So I don't know that it's, it's so much that there are fewer avenues for healthy competition is that we've got so many people who, sh who are looking for that shortcut. And I don't really think in the long run there are shortcuts. If, Malcolm Gladwell is right, and the only way you become a genius at playing the violin or doing anything else is to practice, practice. You know, 10,000 hours is five years of full-time effort. They figure the average employee works 2,000 hours a year, okay? So excellence requires a lot of time and effort, and that doesn't mean, again, getting back to the problem of evil. Some some evil people will prosper, and some good people won't. But I think in the long run, most of us who do the right thing over time with healthy sets of values will do better than the people who take the shortcut. Give you an example. <laughs> talking to my daughter the other night, and <laughs> we were talking about one of my supervisors. She said he was like the boogeyman, you know, when we mentioned his name. I won't mention his name. <laughs> I'm thinking of somebody else who used to work with who had manipulated a situation that he thought would make him president of OSU OKC. He was just sure that he'd set the dominoes in place and made sure that about three, and I didn't think that way. It didn't even occur to me to go back, you know, three years and if I do this, this will happen, this will happen, this will happen, this person will be president of the faculty senate and I'm in, okay? The only problem was he was such a jerk, nobody wanted him back on campus, okay? <laughs> He'd gone to another school. So smart guy, ambitious guy, hardworking guy? No, no, that's not true. Lazy. But, but he was such a jerk. On paper, he looked great. But if you knew him, you're like, not so much, okay? If he'd been harder working, a better colleague, it might have worked out for him. Now, he is president of the school, but he's not president of OSU OKC. So I don't know that there are fewer, because think about it. 
what was it, 1890, 1886, some guy suggested they close the patent office because everything important had already been invented? You know, how many things we haven't thought of that are still coming along in the world that will give us an, uh, uh, an avenue to compete and excel? And that's really the part I didn't talk about, competition and, and excelling at producing something worthy uh, that will benefit people and yourself. Anything else? Kevin, thank you very much. I appreciate it. I enjoyed it.